Uh, there's uh, another scout. Okay, so we're just getting started here. Um, so my name is Greg Thompson. I'm here with my wife, Carolyn Thompson. I'm the counselor for the computer merit badge for the scouts that are online. Um, we're gonna do everything tonight that should help you complete the badge. Uh, you've seen my emails on how this is gonna work. We're going online. We have some cool demos and some live viewing and some uh, presentation slides and some things like that. Uh, I'm an amateur astronomer and a counselor for the astronomy merit badge. And uh, uh, I'm here representing scouting as well as the sponsor of this meeting or this uh, class, which is the Los Angeles Astronomical Society. Um, and we're a group of uh, mostly hobbyists and uh, retired professionals and people with just an interest in astronomy. You may know us from the public star party at Griffith Park Observatory, but we also do a lot of schools around the LA area where we do star parties. And we also uh, have Wednesday nights at Garvey Ranch Observatory, which is currently closed as are many events like Griffith Park Observatory because of COVID. But when those things open up, we're a resource for you guys. Uh, and I would certainly invite you to come out to Garvey Ranch on a Wednesday night when we're open. And uh, I've got some uh, things you can do up in the dome and we have a machine shop and a classroom and I've got some, uh, some gifts for you guys if you do get a chance to make it out. So that's enough of the introduction. Uh, tonight's focus is gonna be on earning the astronomy merit badge. I could go on and on about astronomy and all kinds of things about astronomy but our main focus tonight, other than having some fun and doing some demos, is going to be to make sure that you guys uh, have everything you need to complete the merit badge. So in this virtual forum, uh, the only way I have of really participating you, we're going to do a couple of things where we call on the scouts, uh, where you're going to be participating in looking at a constellation or locating a star um and that sort of thing so when we do that the scout should be prepared so from the uh, materials that i emailed you you guys should all have your astronomy merit badge worksheet uh and you should have a pen because as we talk tonight you can knock out 90 percent of the badge by taking notes from our discussion my presentation goes through the requirements step by step and uh now that you've read the merit badge book uh, between the merit badge book and our discussion um, you should be able to uh, fill in every blank in the worksheet um, so some of the things involve writing down things that you've observed and we're going to talk about how to do that there are a few prerequisites uh, the the four nights of drawing the moon is kind of hard because the moon doesn't rise until after i think about midnight right now um, so it uh i i would accept uh if you guys would like to sketch something different for that requirement, uh, something that's visible not in the middle of the night, uh, I will accept a sketch of four nights, as I said in the email, of Jupiter and Saturn rising in the east in the, uh, kind of in the late evening right now. They're rising around 11 o'clock p.m. right now, which is might be kind of late for you guys, but that does get a bit earlier as each day goes by. So um, if you want to sketch something else for four days, Remember, the requirement is to show how things move. So you have to look at the sky at the same time each of the four nights and show the position of things changing to complete the requirement. So we'll talk about that requirement when we get there. The way you earn the badge is you sit through this class, you participate, you do the demos. We're going to have a couple of shout outs to each of you uh, where you're going to uh, uh, you know, demonstrate that you're, you're looking at things. The other thing you want to have handy, either on your computer, uh, and there's one in your merit badge book, but the one I emailed you, the nightly sky chart, we're gonna to refer to that a number of times. So if I ask you guys to uh, locate a star and tell me what constellation it's in, uh, be prepared to grab your star map and figure out how to use it. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. So that's kind of the introduction. Um, and our first session before break is gonna go through uh, requirements one through four, and then we're gonna do a little demo. And then we're going to kind of see what time it is. And uh, um, at some point, we're going to take a 15 minute break around sundown. And you guys are going to go outside and see if you can find a star and then come back to the meeting after you take your break. So uh, with that, I'm about to switch to the PowerPoint that I'll kick off the discussion of requirement number one. 
um, which is uh, the hazards one. All the batches have a safety uh, requirement number one. So before I start that, uh, does anyone have any questions about how we're going to complete the badge and how you're gonna mail me the worksheet and I'm gonna send you back a blue card? Any questions about the logistics of how we're gonna do this? Okay, if you have your worksheet in front of you, go ahead and fill in your name, your unit number. Uh, your counselor's name is Greg Thompson and uh, you have my email address. Um, so when you send me your worksheet, be sure you give me the address of where you want your blue card to go to so that you can uh, get your badge. If you, the blue card gets misplaced, don't worry, I'll keep my copy and we can always uh, scan it and email you a, a copy if that works. So uh, with no questions, we're gonna jump right in because we have a busy schedule tonight. So I'm going to share screen and show all windows and go to here and yeah hang on i gotta just click on stuff or? i'm looking for it uh, what's the top? insert design transition there it is from the beginning there we go Okay, so this is just the introductory slide. Um, this is the uh, first online version of the Astronomy Merit Badge. Um, like I said, astronomy is a fun hobby, a profession, and also a science, so it's got a lot of really uh, cool aspects to it. Uh, it is a very hands-on um, thing um, when it comes to using telescopes and uh, all that kind of thing. It has an academic side, which is a study and research. Uh, normally, I like to teach this badge at the Garvey Ranch Observatory, where you guys can get up in the dome and put some telescopes out on the lawn and get, get you guys hands-on. We can still do that, uh, but I want you to earn your badge online, and then I'll send you an invitation to attend uh, 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 one of those. So the little graphic up there is actually the picture from our Garvey Ranch Observatory, and that's the telescope that we use up there. And uh, that's the one that uh, I would invite you guys to come and see. Uh, as you can see, it's it's long and narrow, um, bigger than a person. Uh, it's a refracting telescope, we'll talk about that. Your host is the Los Angeles Astronomical Society. I'm Greg Thompson. At this point in time, you should have already read the Merit Badge book. Uh, we're gonna be completing all the requirements as you fill out your workbook. And the checkout is the signed blue card once I get your worksheet. So there's really no point in sending me a partial worksheet. Um, you can if you want to, and I can send you a partial card, but I'd much rather get a complete worksheet, and uh, that way you can earn the badge. Okay, astronomy hazards. And uh, normally we go around and have people think about this, so I'm gonna tell you uh, some of my top ones that I see, and uh, I want you guys to also think about uh, what other hazards and what circumstances you might be involved in, in astronomy, whether it be professional or amateur or on a camp out or whatever. Um, so the first one on my list for your notes is uh, it's outdoors and it's dark because you can't do, you could do solar astronomy during the day and that has its own hazards, but uh, most astronomy takes place at night when we can see the night sky. That is when the earth is facing away from the sun and we're in nighttime, that's when we can see the visible universe in the night sky. So we can see the Milky Way and we can see the moon and we can see the stars. So it usually happens at night. Uh, and what that means is as with any outdoor activity, particularly one you would do at night, um, it's dark, uh, you can stumble around and hurt yourself. Um, and it also could be quite cold. Um, astronomy can be hazardous to the health of astronomers in the old days when they had to sit up on the top of mountains, on the top of ladders, and look through telescopes when it was, you know, 10 degrees below zero. And I think a few astronomers back 100 years ago probably froze to death. Uh, but so when you do uh, astronomy, um, you need to wear proper clothing. Uh, you need to have some way of knowing any hazards that are around you. Um, so at star parties and for astronomy, we don't use bright white lights like flashlights. I mean, flashlights seem an obvious way to a, a bit tripping and hurting yourself. But the problem with bright white flashlights 
is they will spoil your night vision. Uh, I, I don't know if you're aware of this, but your eyes adjust to daytime versus night by changing the size of, what's the right word, pupil? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, the your pupil changes size, right? So we use red lights at star parties. So if you're going to do astronomy, uh, that nowadays they make a lot of great LED headlamps with a red light or a flashlight that has a red light attachment. But just putting a piece of red cellophane over your regular flashlight will work too. So uh, proper clothing uh, for the weather uh, that you are in. Of course, if it's cold or windy or raining, you would wear, um, you know, hat or, or gloves or and a jacket and so forth. Um, the most common injury that I have seen in astronomy is stumbling around in the dark injuries. Um, you can imagine that their standard first aid treatments work uh, because what you're going to get is twisted ankles and jammed fingers and bonked foreheads and, and maybe something a little more serious, but usually it's just a trip and fall. Um, so we use our standard first aid skills to treat those. You know, if the skin is broken, we clean it up and cover it. If it's a, if it's a sprain, we can wrap it up. If, it's, uh, if the person's showing signs of a more serious injury, like an internal injury or a broken bone, we're going to uh, isolate that and get them the help they need, either by calling for, first aid, for, for responders uh, or uh, making sure that the pricing gets out there. So stumbling around in the dark injuries are pretty common in, in astronomy. Uh, I think when I, often when I go to schools and do scouting events, I get some uh, little glowy ring things and I put them around the tripods of my scale, uh, telescope. And that's to protect people from tripping on them and also to protect my telescope from getting kicked, which, which we don't want to have happen. Um, so we can prevent it by using some lights and knowing where we are and we can treat them with standard, uh, standard first aid things. Um, so my third area, is if you're doing any kind of astronomy during the day, and this does happen, right? We have astronomical events that we really want to see. I had an absolutely super time with the club going out to see the total eclipse of the sun uh, three years ago now. Yeah, I think three years ago now. Uh, that's an amazing event. Um, it's unlike anything you will ever see in your in your life to see that black hole in the sky and the birds cry and the uh, the stars come out in the middle of the day. Um, sometime in your life, I hope each of you scouts get a chance to see a total eclipse 2024. <laughs> so uh, start planning today to be in the path of the, that 2024. It's going to cross America again. Uh, you, miss the one next week. you only get a few chances in your life to see a total eclipse of the sun. But do we stare up at the sun during an eclipse? Good way to go blind. It's a good way to go blind, right? So you could use a pinhole camera and project it onto a wall or screen or something. Uh, there are solar filters and glasses you can use, but you've got to make absolutely sure uh, that you are using the properly rated material and that your eyes are protected. Uh, at star parties, you will see people use powerful lasers to point at things in the sky. Uh, I do it. It's a very useful tool to help people locate things in the sky, but these lasers shine quite high in the sky and they're quite powerful. So uh, as cool as it is to try and go buy a powerful laser, you have to be aware that you could damage someone's vision quite easily with one of those. They look like little lightsabers and all you have to do is accidentally point it in someone's eye and it could permanently damage their, uh, their vision. Also, it's totally against the law to point those things in the sky if there's an aircraft nearby. So if you do it, uh, sometimes uh, you can get in a lot of trouble. So we try not to do that whenever there's an airplane around. So please be careful if you're using a laser. So that's my thing. I mean, I, I think astronomy overall is much safer than a lot of other actor uh, activities. It's probably much safer than parachuting or, or high cope or zip lining or any of that stuff that scouts sometimes do, but we still take the precautions. So does anyone have any questions? At this point, you should have notes for number one filled out. Um, on the type of injuries and uh, what you do about them. Uh, now, if you take a few quick notes during the class and you want to, you know, finish reading the merit badge book or refer back uh, and send me your worksheet two days from now, that's absolutely fine. There's no deadline in turning in your worksheet uh, tonight. But I do warn you that if you don't fill out the worksheet, you just sit and listen and you put it off, um, you know, I'd be disappointed that you might not earn the badge. So try to follow along. Uh, you've just completed the first requirement for the badge. So I'm going to move on if no one has any questions.
All right, you'll see on page two of the worksheet, uh, heat reactions, cold reactions, dehydration, bites and sting, C, proper clothing. Just use the common sense answers that we discussed and that you'll read in your merit badge book. Um, this is straight out of uh, uh, second class and first class first aid requirements. Uh, you're unlikely to get traumatic injuries uh, while doing astronomy, but I guess if you were if you were viewing the hundred inch through the eyepiece and you fell to your death on the floor, <laughs> I'll show you a picture of that later. I, I uh, that telescope. If you want to look through that telescope, you got to be not afraid of heights. All right. So much for number one. Uh, a, B, and C. We're going to move on to number two now. So light pollution. So we don't normally think of light as a form of pollution. We usually think of smog or trash or water that's become, uh, you know, infected with uh, toxic uh, chemicals or something. But uh, all that light that we generate from our street lights and our car lots and our buses and trains and cars and houses. If you think about it, all that light we're shining up into the night sky isn't illuminating anything down here on earth. And we are wasting the energy and the money it takes to generate all that light. So in one sense, you could think of it as light waste. It's, it's like the, you know, it's like the exhaust that comes out of cars. It takes, train loads of coal and nuclear power plants and great solar farms and wind farms to generate that electricity. And then we just shine it up into the night sky uh, as waste. So, you know, what exactly does light pollution mean? It means that we are shining light, not down on the ground where we need it to see when we drive around or walk around or, or do activities. Uh, we're actually, the, the, the light uh, from uh, human activity is shining up into the sky and that creates ambient light both up in the sky and kind of all around you right there's particles of dust and fog and light you know, water droplets in the air and the light that comes from you can see the picture of that city you can see there's kind of a glow all around the city that's that wasted light shining up into the sky and into the atmosphere and kind of re-radiating it and shining it back at us. So what does that mean? What does this sky glow mean? It means that when we live in a city like Los Angeles, we really can't see the night sky. That 99% of the things that you could see in the sky if it were dark are fainter than the light pollution. So when you, if you go out tonight and you can spot a few stars or a big planet like Jupiter, uh, you'll see some first magnitude stars. They're visible even in the city. They're bright objects. But you won't see the thousands and thousands of smaller objects that you would see if the sky were truly dark. Um, and that is a form of pollution, in my opinion. We're wasting uh, all the money and the energy to generate that light. And uh, I think there are some movements to, to preserve areas of dark sky around the country and even some movements in cities and developments to uh, install lighting that doesn't shine light you know, up into the sky or, or you know, doesn't uh, shine as much light. So how does air pollution uh, and light pollution combined affect astronomy? Well, it effectively makes viewing in the city fairly limited. Now, if you have a decent telescope, you can still see a lot of stuff from the city. It's not like the sky is blanked out, but if you want to look at fainter objects, you know, you won't even see the Milky Way in Los Angeles. When I go out and I do uh, uh, outreach events at, at schools, elementary schools around LA, most of those kids have never even seen the Milky Way. They don't know what it is or why it's there or that it even exists. So when the scouts, when you get up to camp, you go up to a camp in the mountains or out to the desert away from LA, and you see the Milky Way for the first time, that's quite a thing to see. You're away from this light pollution, and now you can actually get a sense that, hey, we're part of this giant wheel in the sky called the Milky Way galaxy, and that stream of light across the sky that is blocked out when we see the city that's too faint to see against the sky glow, um, that, that's actually millions and millions and millions of stars uh, in the great wheel of the Milky Way. 
So it affects astronomy quite negatively and both amateur and hobbyist and professional astronomers, they wanna to get to the, the highest places as far from humans as they can where it's the darkest and the air is the stillest. So in the early years of Los Angeles, the Mount Wilson Observatory, which you can see from Pasadena up above you, that observatory was built high in the mountains and uh, uh, you know, until LA was really developed, it was one of the most successful observatories in the world because of the 100 inch telescope. So at any rate, uh, that's what light pollution is. It comes almost entirely from human activity. I suppose you could say, well, don't volcanoes pollute the atmosphere with light? But I, I think uh, um, when we talk about light pollution, we mean uh, uh, the light from human activity. So does anyone have any questions about light pollution? This is covered in your merit badge book and you should have uh, some notes down at this point uh, for two. Explain what light pollution is and how it and air pollution affect astronomy. And the air pollution part is when the light pollution hits oh. the air pollution, it shines more and makes the sky glow brighter and blocks out more stars. So astronomers want to go to places like the top of volcanoes in Hawaii and down to Chile and the Canary Islands where there's almost no people and the sky is very clear and high and uh, you could just see uh, literally millions and millions of stars in the sky. If you turn off chat, Sam Whitney has a question. Okay, can you read it to me? Uh, sure, uh, from Sam. Could we still view stars with a telescope even with light pollution? Okay, that's a good question. Sam is asking that if you have a telescope in the city, would you be able to see anything even if there's light pollution? The answer is yes. A telescope uh, can make your eyes effectively, you know, 10 times or 50 times bigger. So um, most of the fainter stars and planets and things like that, you can still see them from the city with a telescope. You just have to know where to point. It can be a little harder to find if you don't have a computerized go-to scope because there's fewer reference stars for you to use. But you can star hop from a bright star over to a thing. The thing that you'll probably have the most trouble with if you're using a telescope in the city is if you're looking for really, really far away and really faint objects like uh, a nebulae, certain nebulae and uh, certain galaxies, they're gonna be just too faint against that sky globe. But that being said, we do public star parties using telescopes throughout the LA basin. And you can see some really cool objects with a regular decent telescope, uh, or even just uh, uh, with uh, binoculars. How about last night? Yeah, I, I bought this attachment to, to, to attach a cell phone to my uh, uh, telescope. And uh, I felt like I had to use it, even though there's a street light in my front yard. So I pointed my telescope at Jupiter and I attached my cell phone to it and took a picture of the moons of Jupiter with my cell phone looking through my telescope. So that was pretty fun. I did finally get it. Awesome. It turns out you were right about the orientation. It needs to be oriented a certain way with the telescope. Mm -hmm. I'll show you guys that. Okay, so uh, you should be good for number two. Uh, and I think we're gonna move on to number three here. All right, astronomical instruments. So this is going to get a little bit technical, but this is covered in your merit badge book. Uh, basically, I'm going to talk about the, the, the three kinds of telescopes. The, uh, there's basically two kinds of mounts, and there are some different kinds of instruments that are attached to these things. And then I'm going to show you some slides of different kind of objects. So let's talk about your, your basic astronomical instrument. And, and I know um, we just had a question about, well, what can I do with a telescope in the city? You know, if you, if you ask for a gift or you save up your money and you want to spend under $100, don't buy one of those cheapy department store telescopes. Uh, a good pair of binoculars is very affordable and it's going to be a much better instrument for you to start with astronomy. Um, now, binoculars are a little bit wobbly, you know, when you hold them like this. Now, I have a pair of binoculars that I'll show you. Uh, this pair of binoculars cost, I think, $120. Okay. I think they're still sharing the screen. Oh. 
So you got to end your share soon. Oh, well, I'll show you that in the demo when I'm done talking about it. I'll show you my binoculars. They make regular binoculars and big binoculars. My binoculars are big and long, so they gather more light. Uh, so it's kind of nice sometimes if you can have a tripod to put your binoculars on, or you can steady your elbows or whatever uh, to look through binoculars. But you'll get better views out of binoculars than you will some of those real cheapy telescopes. That being said, for you know, for a relatively low price, they make very high quality telescopes, and you'd be able to see some amazing stuff uh, if you want one. And we could certainly provide you advice on what kind of telescope should I buy, or you know, we can show you some different kinds of telescopes. So. Uh, Binoculars are a form of refracting. Uh, they're just dual tubes. And uh, so I've got a slide up there. So let's talk about refractors. So refraction means that when light passes through a medium like glass, it changes angle. So like when you put your hand under water and it, your arm looks crooked, right? And what's really Really interesting about refraction is if you have a curved piece of glass called a lens, you can bend the light from that circle down to a point. And that's a way of, of concentrating a larger amount of light, gathering more light into a precise pattern, and then focusing it through an eyepiece. So the very first telescope in the history of the world was um, invented by Galileo and it was a refracting telescope. It had a lens in the front called the primary lens. So you can always tell a refracting telescope because it's got a big piece of glass right in front, just like binoculars do, right? And that piece of glass is a curved piece of glass, just like a magnifying lens, right? Except it's doing, you know, kind of the opposite of magnifying. It's bending light in. And you can see that orange cone in the diagram is concentrating the light down to where the eyepiece is located at the back of the telescope. So you can always tell refractors because they have a big piece of curved glass in front and an eyepiece at the back um, so that you can look through them. Now this particular picture is also um, on a polar mount, which means it's aligned with the North Star. And when you spin it around, it'll help you track the movement of, of things through the sky. So that's refracting telescopes. Now another guy named Newton, invented another kind of telescope, which I'm gonna show you some pictures of in a second. There's just the two kinds of telescopes, refractors and reflectors. The way you can tell a reflector is it doesn't use a big piece of curved glass in the front of it. A reflecting telescope uses a great big, big mirror. So that's why it's called a reflector. They're also called Newtonian telescopes because it was Sir Isaac Newton, the famous uh, physicist on gravity, who actually invented this device. So when you look at a telescope, if it's long and narrow and has a piece of curved glass in the front, it's a refractor. If it is a big, around thing and has a giant curved mirror in the bottom, it's a reflector. There is a third type that I've listed in the slide called a cadiodioptric. And it's a cadioptric is a combination of both. It has a plate in the front that curves the gas, the glass, and it has a big mirror in the back. So I'll show you a slide of one of those in a second. So uh, for instruments, there are basically two kinds of mounts that you will see a telescope on. I'll show you some. Uh, the polar or equatorial mount is the type you see in the diagram on the screen. It's the tilted one that has the counterweight you can see those two counterweights on the bar, and that counterweight system spins in unison with the sky, making it easier to track objects like stars uh, and other things in the sky. Because as you guys are probably aware from reading your merit badge book, the night sky is not static, right? It's always moving. And it's always moving in a circular pattern, like a giant disc in the sky. Uh, I used to teach the merit badge and say, you know, like a, a record player, but these days, most of the scouts just look at me and go, what's a record? So the night sky spins around, and uh, there is actually one star that doesn't move, and it's at the center of that spin. So if you draw a line from the north pole of the earth and extend it out into the sky, it'll point at that one star because everything else spins around that. And let's be clear. It's not the sky, or the fixed stars as we call them, 
that's spinning. They're not moving. We are. We're standing on a ball that's going around that point. So a polar like Polaris, the North Star, is a mount at an angle pointed at the North Star that helps you move your telescope in unison with the movement of the sky. Uh, Gideon asks, what does a refractor telescope look like? Do you want me to go ahead and put on my screen for a while and stop your pause? Um, I, I, I will in just a second. So you see the picture of the telescope currently on the screen, Gideon? That's a refractor, long and narrow, on a tripod, big piece of glass in the front. And I've got some pictures of telescopes coming up. But yeah, Carolyn, if you want to go search out a picture of a uh, refractor, we'll, we'll do that. So there's polar equatorial, then there's alt-as. And alt-as is a two-axis mount, which is the elevation this way from the horizon, uh, and then uh, in a circle pointing around 180. So I'll show those to you in just a second. Uh, instruments, uh, there are various types of instruments you might mount on a telescope. Uh, obviously a finder, you can see the picture of the telescope on the screen has a little tiny spotting scope attached to the back of it. That's to help you find things. So we call those finder or spotter scopes. You might attach a camera to take some pictures. Actually, modern day astrophotography cameras can take much higher resolution pictures than you can see with your eyes. So even if you have a small telescope in the city, if you had a, a DLSR digital camera or an astrophotography digital camera, you could actually get some really amazing things. And we're actually gonna do a demo of that live tonight. Uh, a Dobsonian mount is just a, uh, uh, a mount on the ground and I've got one set up here for our demo. So I'll show you a Dobsonian mount. Uh, John Dobson uh, invented the Dobsonian mount here in California so that uh, you could make your own telescope and, and uh, view the stars from a sidewalk. It's called sidewalk telescopes. Uh, so back to instruments, finder, camera. So a spectrometer is to measure the wavelengths of the light coming from something. And you can gain a lot of scientific information from that. As you guys know, if you shine a light at a prism, out will come different colors. So we talked about refraction. Uh, refraction is when light passes through a medium like a lens and it bends the light at an angle, but it, it bends the different colors at different angles. So we can actually see how much red and how much blue and how much yellow and actually get down to very specific wavelengths. That will tell us what made that light. So we can actually tell what a star is made of by looking at the spectrum of the light that comes from that star. Not all light creates the same spectrum. It depends on what kind of uh, elements are involved in radiating that light. Uh, also, if light passes through something, uh, you, so the spectrum will tell you a lot about what it was, what, what it was that it passed through. So uh, electromagnetic radiation is what we're talking about here. I usually use the word light, but it turns out that light exists on a spectrum of wavelengths, of very short wavelengths to very long wavelengths. We can only see a narrow band with our eyes. We call that light. But all these other kinds of radiation, microwave radiation, radio waves, x-ray waves, they're all part of the same spectrum. So you, they have instruments that can take a picture of the sky in, for example, infrared, which you could use to see in the dark, right? Because you don't, uh, if you had an infrared camera, uh, you could see the glowy parts because people are warmer than the background, right? Infrared radiation is the spectrum of radiation that we associate with heat or warmth. So those are pretty cool things. Um, there is a thing in your book about setup, storage, and care. So I have a slide on the screen there that shows you a little lens case. Obviously, these are optical elements. If you have a pair of binoculars or a great big telescope, you're going to put the eye cups on to protect them and keep them in a uh, protected case and something that'll, you know, prevent them from being scratched or being knocked around. So if you're interested in astronomy, whether you have a, you know, a small, a small little rig just to look at the planets or some big fancy rig, uh, everyone has to work out their own storage and care to not scratch up the lenses uh, and that. So uh, that's a whole thing. All of that stuff I just went over is in your scout book. Um, on your worksheet on page three is a, a picture of a refracting telescope. So you should 
be able to pretty easily, uh, you know, uh, fill in, you know, what is a tripod? What is a finder? The eyepiece is there at the back where you look, the objective uh, lens or the primary curved glasses in the front. Uh, binoculars do exactly the same thing. You can see it's labeled the objective lens in the front. And then it uses a couple of mirrors to bounce the light back so it can bring the light closer together for your eyes. Uh, that, but binoculars are just two refracting telescopes right next to each other, so you can use both eyes. Um, you know, why are they important? Uh, they let us gather more light and see further and see more, uh, which is really cool for a hobbyist, but also really important for uh, research. Um, demonstrate or explain how these, these tools are used. You know, we point them at things at night and we look through them or we use instruments to record the data that comes through them. Uh, uh, how, is, from Sam, how is an X-ray telescope different from a microwave telescope? So they look astoundingly the same, uh, but a radio telescope, radio waves have a much higher uh, wavelength. So, you know, it's, it's like you need a really big antenna. So a microwave telescope or detector uh, can be like six inches across and actually detect a lot of stuff because the waves are really small. But just like radio waves, uh, a radio telescope could be hundreds of feet across. I think the one at Arecibo, they actually use uh, uh, the crater of a volcano and it would take you an hour to walk around it. It's huge. So radio waves are at one end of the spectrum, microwaves are another end of the radio spectrum. and they're both forms of electromagnetic radiation, but the difference is wavelength, and so the detectors are really different. So I hope that answers your question, Sam. Okay, so I'm gonna go now to, uh, uh, I got a slide here for reflecting telescopes because, hey, that's the kind of telescope I have, and that's the one I'm interested in. So I've got a diagram in the upper right-hand side of the slide that shows the light path. It's very different than a refractor. Uh, in that slide, you can see the light entering in from the right-hand side and following the arrows. The arrows. It then hits the curved mirror, which is the primary mirror at the bottom of the telescope, bounces back at an angle, coming together as a cone. It then hits a secondary mirror, which, which is essentially just an angled mirror, and that bounces the light out the side of the telescope where we attach our eyepiece. So are there any cool reflecting telescopes? Well, that big picture of that giant blue monster, that's the 100 inch at Mount Wilson. It is where Edwin Hubble did his research to figure out the expanding research, taking pictures on that telescope. Uh, that The mirror of my reflecting, my personal reflecting telescope is 10 inches across and uh, the one at Mount Wilson is 100 inches across. So it has amazing light gathering capabilities up on, uh, on Mount Wilson. Uh, uh, Palomar is the 200 inch, which is another amazing telescope. Uh, so in the picture of the Mount Wilson blue 100 inch telescope, the mirror is down at the bottom. The cage is where the light comes down the cage. It bounces off the mirror and back up. And if you look inside the blue cage up towards the top, you'll see a black thing back up there. That is the secondary mirror. That bounces the light off to the side. And back when this telescope was first built, that's where you had to be if you wanted to look through it, is up in the top of the dome. Now, just to give you a sense of the scale there, I have stood underneath that telescope and my head just barely reaches the bottom of the telescope. It's about the size of a bus, uh, which is pretty amazing. I think it floats in a bath of mercury uh, in order to make it easy to move, which is pretty cool. Um, I have a picture there of the Hubble telescope, which is, uh, of course, has no problems with uh, a light pollution uh, much coming from the Earth, um, which has taken some amazing pictures because there's no atmosphere. <laughs> the Hubble telescope, of course, is a reflecting telescope. So we went to outer space, caught up with the Hubble. We looked in it. We'd find the exact same design we've talked about. A mirror in the bottom, secondary to gather the data, and no 
uh, lenses to curve the light around. Uh, refracting telescopes do that. So uh, I think that's my last slide for this one. So uh, on B, describe the similarities and differences of several types of astronomical telescopes, including at least one that observes light beyond the visible part of the spectrum. So you could list infrared, you know, and detects uh, infrared radiation, and um, it, it's just a different type of detector. But like if you look at a supernova in the infrared, you're going to see different stuff than if you look in the visible light spectrum. Uh, and so you're going to be able to gather data from different types of electromagnetic radiation. We can't see radio waves with our eyes, but we can if we use a radio dish and gather the data and convert it into something we can see. Uh, so I gave you in my slide three types of instruments. Um, let's see, what did I, uh, what did I say? Uh, a, a finder, which will help you find things. A camera, which would help you record things. And a spectrometer, which would help you look at the different spectra of light coming through your instrument. <clears throat> Describe proper care and storage of telescopes and binoculars. So be sure and put the eye cups and the, and the lens covers on and store it in something uh, that's safe and, and waterproof. So take care of your optical instruments. Okay, so before we start Constellation and Stars, how are we doing on time, Carol? We have time for our demo. Um, sure. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing now. You want to see that uh, picture I pulled up of the uh, refractor? Sure. Okay. Let's make it quick. We want to do our demo here. Okay. It's just an old refractor. All right. Well, it's a very typical refractor. Uh, there's a few things you can see immediately. It's in an observatory dome, um, and it's long and narrow, uh, which is typical of refractors. It's gonna have a piece of curved glass in the very front. That's why that cover's up there on top of it. It looks like it's covered right now. Yeah. Back at the back, straight through, you can see the eyepiece at the very back where you would look through. And the eyepiece is another piece of uh, a lens that straightens the image out for your eyes. If you can see right in front of the eyepiece, there's a, a focus knob there to, to move the eyepiece in and out a little and get a clearer focus. That big thing mounted on top is the finder scope. Uh, and you can look through the finder scope, but it's to help you align uh, the telescope uh, with whatever object you're looking at in the sky. So it essentially is the same as a scope on a rifle, right? It helps you sight in the main scope. So you guys should recognize this type of mount. You see that counterweight system and it's mounted at an angle. Uh, we call this a polar or equatorial mount. And again, if you followed that axis there in the center of those wheels pointing straight up in the direction of the sky, that would point straight at the North Star. So as the sky wheels around the North Star, you can spin this telescope to match that tracking. And it looks like this one has got a little motor, so it will automatically track with the sky. If you point a telescope at the sky and just leave it there, Whatever you pointed at will be gone in like five minutes, depending on how powerful your scope is. Yeah, and so uh, uh, a lot of, of powerful telescopes and even some of the modern ones you can buy have tracking mounts or motors and they will track with the sky and they will stay on whatever you point them at. So, okay, you wanna switch to the camera over here? So when I'm talking about these scopes, this is a good time to chat a question or be, filling out uh, uh, your worksheet. Uh, I'm gonna do a demo of my, uh, of my daub and a star wheel and some binoculars here. So Carolyn's gonna switch to her camera. Okay, I'm not sure how to do that. Well, you got it up. Yes, but uh, does everybody see my camera? Are you sharing? It's right at the top. You're not sharing. Well. Yes, but share screen, it is sharing my screen. Click that. There you are. 
Okay, so that's, you're sharing that. No, I told it to. No, you're not sharing. Yeah, because it's already on the screen. Well, tell them just to make it big then. Portion of the screen. There we go. Come on. I don't know what you told us to do. Yeah. Okay, don't do that. Okay, just make make the screen big while I do the demo. So you need to point it up. Okay. Can you see me? No. Nope. Uh, the primary, I can only see your screen. I cannot see my screen. I don't understand. Come and take a look. I did this test a little bit. Yes, but your computer wasn't on at the time. What does what my computer have to do with this? I don't know. You're not sharing. You need to share. Content from second camera. Wrong camera. Wrong camera. Uh, okay. No. Okay, double click on this. There you go. All right. Get something to make sure people can know. Can you see me? Uh, I'm cutting off your head. All right. Well, whatever you want to do. Okay. So I'm hoping that you guys can hear me and see me, what I'm doing here. Uh, this is my uh, Dobb-mounted Newtonian telescope. It has a 10-inch mirror at the bottom, which is down by my feet. Um, so it's on a sidewalk or Dobsonian mount. I'm spinning it around, and I'm moving it up and down right now. It just is on some wheels. It does not have a tracking motor, whatever you point it at. It just stays on it until it moves. So the light path here is the light comes from the sky, passes down into the bottom of the telescope, hits the mirror, just like the big one, uh, Mount Wilson, bounces back up, and there is a secondary mirror right here that bounces the light out the side. So when I'm observing, I'm standing to the side like this, and I'm looking like that. And this is the eyepiece. Um, I can show you that real quick. So this is, uh, that's a little adapter. <laughs> and this is the eyepiece. I have about 10 different eyepieces I use. Uh, and the eyepieces will determine the amount of magnification. Uh, it sounds like, well, you, why wouldn't you use as much magnification as possible? Of course, as you magnify, you lose resolution. And also, as you magnify, things in the sky move more quickly. So sometimes, you know, you can only magnify so much, depending on things. Here's the focus knobs. So by moving this, that moves the eyepiece in and out, and it'll find that precise focus point where the image is nice and clear. Uh, this thing here, which is called a Telrad, is a form of finder scope, and this helps me find things in the night sky. Uh, and then I also have another spider scope that I can mount right here. So this is a 10 inch Dobsonian reflecting telescope. I use it at the Griffith Park Observatory of Star Parties. I've used it up in the mountains and at scouting events. And uh, we've really seen some amazing things uh, with our eyes through this telescope. We were talking about binoculars. This is the binoculars I use. Uh, really nice binoculars. You can see the moons of Jupiter in these binoculars. You can see the rings of Saturn, not very clearly, but you can see them with these binoculars. You can certainly see star clusters and planets, and the moon comes very nice through these binoculars. And uh, you can see they're kind of extra long, and they're a little bit big, so that they have a long focal length. They're 9 by 63s. What I found is it's hard to hold these steady because they're heavy. So if I had it to do over again, I might actually uh, get shorter ones that won't, don't tire my arms out and don't wobble as much. Uh, what's on the bottom? Does it have a, no, that's, does it have a tripod mount? 
But it does not. Yeah, you have, for these particular ones, yeah. yeah, if you get a set of binoculars, you might ask about, do they have the little screw hole thing? Because if you can put them on a tripod, uh, it'll be way easier to look at objects through the sky. Uh, but yeah, you could see the Andromeda Galaxy in a pair of binoculars, and I'd be happy to show you how to do that. So I have a few other things to demo for you when I'm stargazing using my telescope. Uh, this is a star wheel. And just like the one you have, except this one spins around and shows me what the sky looks like year round and from hour to hour. So I have a gift of one like this for each of you. So if you make it out to the observatory later this year, I'll give you the gift for earning the badge, which will be your own star wheel. I sent you the one that I hope you printed out, which is good for June of this year. And we'll be using that one tonight. Um, so there are other resources. I, I, I subscribe to Sky and Telescope, uh, which has a monthly star map in the center, uh, which is very convenient. I use that a lot. Um, and has articles and pictures. This one was about uh, the moon and our return to the moon uh, last year. Great articles and a, a great magazine. Also, the Sky, the Sky and Telescope website has an interactive uh, sky chart that I find really useful. So I think I'll probably demo that when we do our constellation thing in a little bit. Um, I've got my astronomy for dummies, which is something I use occasionally. Uh, here's a basic astronomer's guide that I, I, I enjoyed reading. It's a book I found at the bookstore. Um, and then usually when, I, uh, when I'm going to go observing like on a camp out or a star party, the, the, the day before I'll get my star chart out and figure out what's going to be visible and uh, and figure out what I might want to look at, right? What constellations are going to be up and what kind of uh, targets I'm going to see. Uh, so uh, that's a demonstration of my job. Uh, that's a Newtonian reflecting telescope, and it's out of its box right now. So uh, uh, before the night is over, I will probably uh, uh, put it in there. Uh, and store it properly <laughs> and, and the eyepiece and everything else. So that's one through three. Um, the next section, what do we have on our uh, schedule, Carolyn? Are we getting close to break? It's not dark out yet, so we can't go outside. Uh, does any of the scouts have any questions about the first requirements you've completed? Do you want to go on to four or take a break? No feedback? Uh, let's, Gideon is asking and Sam is asking about 3C where you have to explain what you use with the telescopes and then Sam is asking can we start 4A? Okay. Sam, in a moment. All right. Okay, so uh, 3C. Uh, those are instruments mounted on astronomical telescopes. So the answers you want to put there are uh, eyepiece. That's the little lens that you attach right so you can look through you can say finder which is the finder scope attached to a telescope to help you find things um you got two cameras on me that's confusing uh you can put spectrometer which is a type of device that you can mount on a telescope to look at the spectrum that you're looking at um what was one of our other answers finder eyepiece camera Camera, thank you. You can attach a camera to a telescope. So a there's four instruments for you. Um, uh, and what is the purpose of a finder to help you locate things? What is the purpose of a camera to take pictures? What is the purpose of a spectrometer to look at the wavelengths of light or to you know look at the spectrum of the light? Uh, and uh, what is the eyepiece? That's so you can look through it with your eyeball. Um, that's for seeing or looking with your eye. So I hope that answers your uh, uh, your three C question. So we could go ahead and get started on four A if you guys are going. We could uh, we could get going on that. Uh, Sam says, "Can we start four A?" Yeah, four A. Let's start four A and then we'll take our break. Uh, so I'm going to go back to presenting. Oop, that's not what I wanted. Uh, 
There we go. Uh, number four, constellation and stars. So uh, 4A is identify in the sky 10 constellations of at least four which are on the zodiac. So I've got a slide that basically has the answers for you. And by the way, I sent you your sky map. The, they can't see that. Oh, okay. Can I see that? <laughs> this no, camera? because they're looking for your computer screen. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so the evening sky map I sent you, and also the, the Astronomy Merit Badge book has some sky maps in it. So you could just write in the answers to 4A, uh, copying from the slide that I'm going to show you, picking ones from your sky map or from your Merit Badge book. So the stuff I'm going to talk about, uh, I already talked about the night sky, the stars slowly circle overhead all night long. How long does it take for the sky to make one complete revolution and go back to its original starting position? The answer to that should be pretty obvious, 24 hours, because that's how long it takes the Earth to make one revolution. And why do the stars circle around like that? Because the Earth is spinning. And what is the pole star? That is the star directly above the North Pole, that's the star that doesn't move. It's at the center of the rotation. So when you're looking at the night sky, you have to always think about, okay, I stand with my back to the south and my face to the north. So I'm facing the North Star. My right hand is the east. Things are rising there, just like the sun and the moon and the planets and the stars. Everything rises in the east. On my left hand, everything is setting. The sun sets in the west, planets set in the west. So getting yourself oriented and using your sky map will help you understand how things move at night. So a constellation is from Latin. It just means grouping of stars. And we just sort of make outlines of stars. There's no meaning. Many civilizations have had different constellations. Uh, and, uh, you know, you're probably familiar with the constellations of the zodiac. I mean, there's a whole thing about what sign were you born under. So what that means is there's a band of constellations around the sky, <coughs> which is called the ecliptic. And that's the band that the sun and the moon and the planets travel through. Why do the sun and the moon and the planets travel across a line in the sky? Because the solar system is a disk. And so they follow the same track through the sky. So, you know, as the sun goes around, uh, actually, as we go around the sun, the sun is in different positions of the zodiac. So that'll be marked on your sky map as the ecliptic, and all the constellations in the ecliptic are uh, ones of the zodiac, and, and they have some mythical or potentially uh, astrological significance, but um, for astronomy, they're just constellations like the rest. There's no, nothing magical about them. Uh, so, uh, in order to do this badge, you need 10 constellations and 10 stars. We're going to make it easy. And we're going to learn 10 constellations, and we're going to learn one star in each of them. So, you learn a constellation, you'll also learn a star. So, uh, what is the Milky Way galaxy? It's 100,000 light years across, although current research in dark matter and some other stuff going on uh, may be a lot bigger than that. We're, uh, maybe you guys will grow up and, and you'll be involved in figuring out how big the Milky Way really is. Uh, when I was young, it was 100 billion stars. Right now, they're thinking it's more like 200 to 400 billion stars. <coughs> but maybe that's an area of research. So I put a picture of a galaxy up on the slide. You can see it's a beautiful spiral galaxy. Um, you can see the arms of that galaxy. You can see the center. There's a supermassive black hole in the center of the whole thing. Uh, there's billions and billions of stars. The whole thing spins around. And our universe is made out of galaxies, and the Milky Way is the galaxy that we live in. So let's move on. So here's the answers to your question. Uh, get out your planisphere, spin it around to June. In this case, you've got the one that you printed or the one in your merit badge book in the evening. So uh, assuming you have your sky map, if you'll notice, uh, it's labeled north and south, right? So you're gonna face in that direction 
Uh, and then this map will correspond to the night sky. So there's a couple of constellations that I think that you should be familiar with. So first thing I want you to do is locate the North Star. It's in the middle of the map, a little closer to the north. Uh, and it's at the tip of the handle of the Little Dipper, and it's called Polaris. So that's your first star and your first constellation. It's called Ursa Minor. It's called the Little Dipper. You really, it's hard to see in the city because some of those stars are kind of faint. But Polaris itself is quite bright and visible even in the city. So at this point, you should be able to locate Ursa Minor and Polaris. But sometimes it's kind of hard to find things in the sky. <clears throat> so if you look off to the west of Polaris, you'll see Ursa Major, which we call the Big Dipper. This is how most people learn to find Polaris in the sky. If you'll notice, the two outer stars of Ursa Major in the cup point right at Polaris. So if you're looking at the night sky and you can see the bright stars of the Big Dipper, you will see that they point, the two outer stars are a pointer right to Polaris. So that's an easy way to find Polaris. Uh, why is Polaris important? It's the pole star. It's the star around which the sky revolves. And also, it points to true north. So if you don't have a compass or your cell phone, you can always find which way is north by locating Polaris. So that's two of our constellations right off the bat, Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. Polaris is in Ursa Minor. The star Mizar is in Ursa Major, and it's in the handle. And it's a double star. So if you point a telescope at that one, you'll see two tiny stars. Well, one of them's not so tiny, but it is a double star. So uh, Arcturus is in boots. So if you find the Big Dipper, the two stars at the very tip of the handle of the Big Dipper point to a bright red magnitude one or brighter red giant called Arcturus. That is in a a uh, constellation called Boots, or Boats, and Arcturus is a, a star that's clearly visible in the night sky, almost directly overhead this time of year. So if you go out tonight, you should be able to find Arcturus, the bright red star, and again, you can find it because if you found the Big Dipper, the two end stars of the handle of the Big Dipper point almost directly at Arcturus. Uh, Lyra in Vega is, let's see, I should, looking over, okay, so it's around in the southern horizon, so we're going to do some southern horizon ones now. Uh, where is, where did Lyra go? Oh yeah, so Lyra is Vega, it's almost directly overhead, right in the middle of the map, it's a bigger dot. Uh, Lyra is a tiny little constellation that you can barely see. James can see it with his naked eye in the city, but I can't. <coughs> but you can certainly see Vega. Vega is one of the brightest stars. I think it is, it is the definition of magnitude zero. Uh, it is a very bright star, uh, a tremendous uh, blue star uh, directly overhead. And, and uh, it's, it's right uh, on the edge of the Milky Way. That, that yellow or, or blue band that runs across your star map, that's the Milky Way. So it's, uh, it's right there along the edge of the Milky Way. Okay, so what's our next one? Uh, Cygnus, part of the Summer Triangle. Where did Cygnus go? Okay, so to the left of Vega is a constellation called Cygnus the Swan. It's in a cross shape. <clears throat> also called the Northern Cross. It's an easy constellation to spot near Vega because it's in the form of a T or cross. And at the base of the T is a, a magnitude one star called Deneb. So if you can find Vega, you can find Deneb. And it's right in the heart of the Milky Way. So Cygnus the Swan is flying along in the Milky Way, if you can see it. You can't see it in the city, but you can definitely see Vega and Deneb. So uh, if you find Vega and Deneb, you found two of the magnitude one or better brighter stars that are visible in the city of what's called the Summer Triangle. And it's marked on the map. The third one is Altair in Aquila, 
which is to the south and below Vega and Deneb. And uh, so that's your sixth constellation and bright star. And where did Castor and Pollux go? Uh, Libra, are they part of the summer sky? Huh. Yeah, I think I think they're gone already. Well, you can put them down. They're bright stars, but uh, I don't think they're visible this time of year. Uh, Leo is on the ecliptic, which is going to be to the very west of your map. And the sickle of stars uh, on the ecliptic there is uh, Leo the lion. And the bright star in Leo that's visible uh, in the western horizon that's looking towards the beach is Regulus. And in, to the left of that is a constellation called Virgo. You can't see most of those stars in the city. James can see them. Maybe you guys have good eyes. Uh, but Spica is going to be your star there. The star I want you to spot tonight, if you continue to the left, so now you're facing south, southeast, along the Milky Way, is Scorpius, which is going to be on the bottom of your star map near the south. Scorpio, the scorpion with his tail, his long crooked tail. So there's a giant red star right in the heart of Scorpius. It's called Antares. It's a huge star. It's hundreds of times bigger than the sun. And in the night sky, it's actually red. So I want you to go out and see if you can spot off to the south uh, uh, in the uh, ecliptic or the zodiac Scorpius. Look for the red beating heart of the scorpion, Antares the red giant. Uh, and that will be the last of your, your 10 stars and constellations. So I can't be there with you to point a laser at the sky and help you guys memorize these things. Uh, I'm hoping that when we take our break, we're gonna take about a 15 minute break. I'm gonna add a little time to our break um, so that you can go in your backyard, assuming that it's safe, uh, you know, and that you've got a place you can go look at the sky without going too far. If you've got a parent around that can go with you and help you find stuff, that would be great. Uh, and I know that no one, you know, on your own, you're not going to find all 10 of these, uh, but make it a goal to find at least one. Uh, if you want to try and find the beating heart of Antares or Polaris or one of the ones, when we come back, I'm going to e ask each one of you uh, if you were able to find one. Uh, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, Jupiter and Saturn will be rising uh, off to the east. Uh, later tonight, if you're up late and you want to sketch it, uh, it'll be earlier than that. They're, they're, it's before 11, yeah. But it's getting earlier each night. Jupiter and Saturn will be with us all summer. So those, those are going to be my recommendations for your answers to 4A, the 10 constellations. And then 4B, just uh, pick eight of the 10 you just did. Um, so uh, Ursa Minor, Ursa Major, Boots, Lyra, Cygnus, Aquila, Gemini, Leo, Virgo, and Scorpio. Um, and then you could just fill in eight stars uh, from there. And uh, I think these are all, all the ones I listed are magnitude one or brighter so that you can see them in the city. Okay, so 4C is make sketches of the Big Dipper. In one sketch, show the Big Dipper's orientation in the early evening sky. In another sketch, show its position several hours later. So this is going to be pretty easy. Look on your star map and you'll see uh, the Big Dipper. Um, it has a shape you're familiar with. You know, it has a cup and a handle. Um, you're going to go out in your backyard tonight. I hope you can see off to the north. Um, if you can't, I'll, I'll work with you and we'll get you something else to sketch. But the object of this is for you to sketch how the night sky changes even after a couple of hours. So go out in your backyard, face to the north, find the Big Dipper, look at the horizon, and draw a sketch of where it is. And, and in your workbook, it shows the North Star, so you can actually see how it's going to come out. And the two outer stars of the cup are going to point at the North Star from some angle that you're going to view, right? Then you go out two hours later, and the Big Dipper is going to be, you know, rotated around a bit uh, because the sky has changed. So, so your 4C map is going to have two pictures of the Big Dipper from actual viewing that you do 
one early in the evening and one from a couple hours later showing the rotation, two hours of rotation. So uh, it'll be in a different position. All right, so Sam is asking, to, are, we, are they supposed to try to fly each of the stars at a list? Um, I, as many as they can. Uh, I, I would say at, for tonight, when we come back, if you can find two or three of them, that would be getting an A with no help. We are remote here. Um, if you are already somewhat familiar with the sky and you can get half of them, that's an A+. Uh, if you can do all 10 on your own, I just hand you the badge right now because that's remarkable, um, especially in the city where it's hard to see the sky. So set a goal to find one or two if you can. And when you come back, tell me what you found. Uh, if you can find the North Star, if you can find the North Star and uh, the Big Dipper, if you can see it from your backyard, you can go ahead and finish 4C tonight, right? Just do two sketches, one after class, and then you're done, right? So that gets us up through 4C. Uh, I'm going to do 4D, and then we'll take our break because we're making a lot of progress here, but it's a lot of, of Mr. Thompson talking. And I appreciate you guys chatting questions. That's really, really helpful because uh, I'm really used to having the scouts with me and you know, people ask questions and that's cool. So 4D, explain what we see when we look at the Milky Way. So what we look, uh, and you can't see it in the city, so you're just gonna have to use your star map. It, it just looks like this milky path, this, this glowy white path across the sky. And it stretches from horizon to horizon. Um, but it says explain that, right? So what I want you guys to think about is what shape is the Milky Way? That's why I put that slide in with the picture, right? Uh, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, so if you think about it, the Milky Way is 100,000 light years across. And if we get to it, I'll talk about what a light year is. It's a measure of distance. but uh, um, in other words, really, really, really big. It, it, it would take a beam of light 100,000 years to cross from one side of the Milky Way to the other. But it's only 1,000 light years thick. So it's a giant wheel or disk in the sky, right? And if you think about it, we're in the middle of that disk. We're about 25,000 light years from the center. If you find the beating heart of, uh, of Scorpio tonight, that is in the direction of the center of the Milky Way. So if you're facing Sagittarius and Scorpius, you're facing the center and your back leads to the rest of the Milky Way behind you. So what is that band of milky white stuff through the sky? Well, the Milky Way is the shape of a Frisbee and we're in the middle of it about one quarter of the way out from the center. And when we look around, when you look along the axis of the disc or the Frisbee, you see millions of stars. But if you look at a right angle out away from the Frisbee or the disc, you don't see any stars really at all because there aren't very many. So what you're looking at when you see the Milky Way is you're actually seeing the wheel or disc of the Milky Way through the edge where you you could see the millions and millions and billions of stars. One of the great revelations uh, in science happened after Galileo invented the telescope 400 years ago, is when they pointed, uh, people thought it was some kind of gas or magic, or they didn't know what it was, right? Just this white band through the sky. But when we started pointing the first telescopes at it, the more powerful our telescopes got, all we saw was more stars and more stars and more stars. So. Uh, the Milky Way is a galaxy of stars in the shape of a disk. And the reason we see it as a path of white across the sky is that's looking out along the disk. Um, so I, uh, I, I think that makes sense. Uh, yeah, if you want to grab a picture of the Milky Way, we'll talk about it. I always thought it was remarkable. When you go out to the night sky and you see the Milky Way, you can actually like feel the orientation. Like, hey, we're in the Milky Way. And the center is over there and the edge is that way. And all that white stuff are the billions and billions of stars uh, in our galaxy. So I think Carolyn's going to show us a picture. We'll leave it up for the break. Um, if you have a, a, a chat, uh, I'm going to have a 15-minute break. 
and that'll give you a chance to use the restroom and get a drink and take your star map outside. Uh, this is an actual picture that I think Carolyn took at Lockwood, at Lockwood from the, one of our LAAS uh, observatories. Uh, and mm -hmm. thank you for the cool, Sam. I appreciate that. All right. So what time is it, Carolyn? How are we doing on time? Uh, it's 8.20. 8.20. So we come back in 15 minutes and we'll do a round robin and we'll finish up with uh, like five, six, and seven. And then starting at nine, we have some demonstrations for you guys. I hope you find it interesting. There are some club members who have joined our meeting tonight and they have some live demonstrations for us and we really appreciate that. We also have uh, some scientists. Uh, actually, we have an astrophysicist joining up for our career panel tonight. So if you guys have any questions like, well, what does an astrophysicist do? Or how much does an astrophysicist make? Or do astrophysicists have to learn a lot of math? I want you to ask Tim some questions because he's the real deal. He's from JPL and it'll be a real honor to have him later. Uh, Spencer and Kevin have joined. They'll be joining around nine. We'll be sharing their screens. And I want you to know that we're doing a live demonstration of, uh, of a live cameras through telescopes. And it's pretty cool digitally that we can do that. And uh, so I hope we'll see some real objects tonight through telescopes and you guys can ask some questions about those objects. So at, if you said it was 820? 823 now. Okay, so we'll, we'll start again at 840. Is that route right? Okay. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna take my break too. Um, if you have any questions, put them in the chat and Carolyn will pick them up. And at 8.40, we'll pick up with going around and you can say what you saw. And we'll talk about finishing the requirements before our nine o'clock demos and panel. Thanks a lot for joining. Okay, um, it's 8.40 and I'm just getting ready to get restarted here. I went outside and the sun wasn't all the way down yet. So uh, the only star I could find was Vega. Um, and I'm gonna, as the scouts rejoin us here, um, I'm gonna go around and you guys can tell us if you are able to spot Vega or your eyes are better than mine and you can see something else. I'm also gonna de demonstrate an interactive sky map here in a second. We'll go back to the slides to finish the requirements. Uh, and in about 20 minutes, we'll start our remote viewing session and you guys can start seeing some live, uh, live telescope stuff. So, um, Carolyn, I'm ready to do my round robin. So, uh, let's see. Uh, is Gideon available? Gideon, if you could come off mute. Uh-huh. Are you there? Say hi, Gideon. Hi. Uh, we can't hear you, Gideon. Say hi. Hi. We can't hear you. Really? Oh, let me. Are you on? Yeah, I got it. Okay. All right, Gideon, were you able to see uh, Vega up overhead or anything, uh, even though the sun wasn't quite down yet? 
Not much. No. Nothing. Not much. Okay, so almost straight overhead is a really bright star called Vega. It's on the list in your uh, that you're going to do for the ten stars and constellations. Uh, so you should be able to spot that one. Um, if you stay to the end and you want to stay up a little bit later, you can go back out and start your uh, your your Big Dipper sketch and uh, your ten constellations. So um, it, I'm sorry, I'll time the. The next one I'll time it all better so that we take our break and it's a little darker outside, but astronomy is at night. So thanks for checking and, and I'm sure you can see Vega. I was able to see Vega straight overhead. So thanks a lot and let's go and see if uh, Sam was able to see anything. Uh, Gideon, you can go on mute. Sam, you can come off mute. Are you with us, Sam? Okay, maybe he's still on break. How about Charles? Are you with us, Charles? If you're with us, Charles, you can come off mute. Hello? Hey, Charles. Uh, Were you able to go outside and see anything overhead? Uh, no. No. No? Yeah. So there's a super bright star straight overhead called Vega and Lyra. That's one of your, uh, one of your 10 and your 8. So um, either tonight or tomorrow night. I'm going to demonstrate an interactive sky map. And I'm going to show Jupiter rising uh, in about two hours. So if you want to go out and do your sketches of Jupiter, you can start that uh, tonight if you want. Okay. Um, so I'm sorry that it was still light out, so there wasn't much to see. It is actually a clear night, so I'm thinking we may get some good telescope viewing here in a minute. Uh, so uh, thanks, Charles. And uh, River, are you with us? Yes. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Were you able to go outside? Uh, yeah, I couldn't. I could. I couldn't really see any stars. I could see one star. Stars. I I wasn't yeah. sure if it was an airplane or a star, but I'm assuming that it was a north star because I think that's supposed to be the brightest one. Uh, actually, Paris is not the brightest star. Was it off to the northern horizon a bit, or was it more straight overhead? Um. Okay, let's think. Uh, the northern horizon. Uh, and that would be towards Pasadena and the mountains would be the northern horizon. Um, I guess I'd say it was more northern. Yeah, that might have been Polaris. That's a good spot. Um, if you, uh, again, when I say face the north, uh, you're going to turn your body towards the mountains here in L.A., towards Pasadena, and then up at about a 30-degree angle, is going to be Polaris, which is the North Star. That's why it's in the north. And All so right. once you're oriented in that way, you're on your right-hand side will be the east. That's where things rise. And then on your left-hand side is the west towards the ocean, and that's where things set. So that'll help you get oriented to see if you can spot some of the constellations for your, uh, for your worksheet. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the presentation here, and we'll finish that up. Uh, let's see, where is my presentation? Yeah. Astronomy, Zoom Cloud, let's see if this is it. Uh, I don't think that's it. Carolyn, what came through? The sky and telescope thing? The nothing. Okay. Have you had that trouble before? Well, it's, oh, here it is. Okay. Did that come through the presentation? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's like. Okay. Uh, so let me shrink this down. Okay. All right. So that's uh, number four are constellations and stars. Uh, the only star I was able to see was. Uh, uh, Vega, which is in Lyra, almost directly overhead. River thought he was able to spot Polaris off to the north and Ursa Minor. And Ursa Major is the pointer stars there. So moving on so that we can get you through your packet. And I'm then sorry to more. interrupt, but I just looked at the compass on my phone and I don't think that was the north. I think it's more of like the, um, maybe like the east. Okay. So you can look on your star map okay. and off to the east. Uh, it might it might have been Vega. Vega is a little bit more overhead. Uh, yeah, it could have been Altair. 
there's only about 10 magnitude one stars you can see in the city really clearly. So I'm going to guess it was probably Altair. Okay. And that's in Aquila. It's part of the summer triangle. It's a mag one star for your packet. So you can check that off as observing. All right. So let's move on uh, to five. Uh, list the names of the five most visible planets. Of course, they only thought there were five planets because they're the only ones you can see with your naked eye. Um, it should be pretty clear to you guys to list the ones you can see with your naked eye. Uh, it's actually pretty hard to spot Mercury, although it is pretty clearly visible to the naked eye. The problem is, if I tell you guys to go out and look for Mercury, it's going to blind you because Mercury... Oh, sense all Gemini. oh, good. Yeah. So, yeah, Gemini is setting right now. It's a more winter constellation. Uh, so it's visible off in the west. Good spotting, uh, uh, Sam. Nice job. So uh, Mercury and Venus are inner planets in the sense of they're very close to the sun. And what that means is they're always really close to the sun. So you can only see Mercury and Venus at sunrise or sunset. Or during an eclipse. Or during an eclipse, right? That's true, Carolyn. Um, so... Uh, Venus is super, super, super bright. It'll look like a train spotlight coming out through you in the evening or morning sky. Mercury is a little bit harder, much smaller. Um, if you have one of those uh, sky apps for your phones, it can really help you know what's where and, and uh, what's coming up when. Mars is an inner planet, just like the Earth, uh, and, but it's actually further out from the sun than the Earth. So that's why I put an asterisk there. The planets that are in towards the sun, if we look at them from the side or full on or on the other side of the sun, Mercury and Venus actually have phases like the moon. So there's a crescent Venus and a half Venus and all that. If you look at Venus through a telescope, you can clearly see, you know, a crescent Venus or whatever. There are only two outer planets visible to the naked eye, uh, and that's Jupiter and Saturn. The good news is they're rising all summer long. So they're very easily visible to the naked eye. Right, right now they're rising around 11. That'll get earlier in the evening all summer long because we're, the Earth is changing its orientation in that direction by orbiting the sun. And uh, if you stay up tonight to finish your packet and work on your stuff, you'll see Jupiter and Saturn rising in the east. Jupiter will be the bright one. Saturn will look more like a star down and to the left of Jupiter. But it, the way to tell a planet from a star is... Planets, I know it's hard to tell with your eye, but you'll get used to it once you look at a few planets. Planets are actually disks. Uh, now, they're very small disks to the naked eye, but because they're disks, they're not points of light like a star. Stars twinkle. Planets do not twinkle because uh, twinkling is caused by a point of light passing through the atmosphere and getting pushed around. Stars, that happens. But with planets, uh, you almost never see that. So planets will shine in a steady disk-like light. The planets occur in a line across the sky called the ecliptic, and that's because the solar system is roughly a flat disk, and so everything traces the sky in the same line. And you can see that on your star map. So those are your five planets for 5A. Uh, so 5B, uh, here's a slide just sort of, of some distances. Uh, I, I've got some distance stuff for you guys, uh, just so you'll uh, understand some things. So, uh, the speed of light is 670 million miles per hour, or 186,000 miles per second. Uh, in kilometers, that's 299,000 or 300,000 kilometers per second. So, light is very, very quick. In one hour, it can go 670 million miles. Uh, so how far is the Earth from the sun? And then looking at this map, the Earth is 94 million miles from the sun. Uh, and that's 151 million kilometers. We call that one AU, or one astronomical unit. It's just a way of measuring things, like how far is the Earth from the sun? One astronomical unit. So if we look at Saturn, Saturn is really far away. Saturn is a gas giant. It's a huge planet, but it's so far away that it actually looks really small in the night sky. 
but with a decent pair of binoculars or particularly with a good telescope, you can clearly see the rings of Saturn. Very easy sight to do even in the city. But that's 10 times uh, the distance of the Earth from the sun. Uh, so if you do the math real quick, uh, that's 940 million miles. Uh, so it takes more than an hour for uh, light to travel from the sun yeah. to Saturn. So if you were sitting uh, at the sun and having a conversation over a radio with someone on Saturn, you'd say hi, and an hour later they would hear you say that, and they would say hi back, and you would get your reply uh, in two hours. So that gives you a sense of the time and distance. Jupiter's a little bit closer. It's about half that distance, 481 million miles or 5.2 AU. And by comparison, you know, the Milky Way is 100,000 light years across. So you can imagine the, the distance. A light year is a thing, is a measure of uh, distance. Um, it's the amount of a distance that a light beam can travel in a year. It's about 10 trillion kilometers or 63,000 AUs. So this little uh, planetary system, this little solar system we live in, you know, uh, it would take an hour of, for light to get to Saturn, approximately. It would take six hours to get out past Pluto and the edge of the Kuiper belt. Um, and if you waited a year, it would have traveled, uh, 63,000 AUs, and if you waited 100,000 years, that beam of light could travel the whole distance of the Milky Way. So that's some distances for you on, on how things are oriented. Uh, the rocky inner planets are Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Then there's the asteroid belt, and there are some small round uh, asteroids that are almost planets. They're classified as dwarf planets like Ceres. Once you get past the asteroid belt are the outer gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, and then the planets that were discovered with telescopes and you need a telescope to see, Uranus and Neptune. Beautiful, beautiful things to see in the telescope. They're not in the night sky right now. They're on the other side of the sun. Uh, Pluto is way out there in the Kuiper belt, along with some other objects that they've discovered very similar to Pluto, and they're, now they're calling it a dwarf planet. Okay, so the next slide. So I filled this out for you on what's visible when there's a chart. I'll leave this slide up for a few minutes if you wanna check things off a little bit, what's visible when. But if you'll use your phone app, Starry Sky, or you use the Sky and Telescope uh, interactive sky map, you can go out and rotate the sky around and see what's visible on your own uh, rather than just blindly copying my chart. But as you can see, here we are in June of 2020. Mercury is visible right at sundown right now, uh, but be careful, don't look at the sun. But you can see Jupiter and Saturn are visible in June, July, August, and September. And those are the only two planets as they uh, move earlier and earlier, uh, excuse me, later and they're, they're be rising earlier and visible most of the night. As we get into the fall, Mars comes up, uh, rising in the east and is visible uh, into next year when it'll start to disappear. Uh, Mercury and Venus are a little bit trippier because they're close to the sun and you need to be looking at sunrise or sunset for them to be visible. So I'll leave that slide up for a second uh, as far as what planets are visible. The main thing I want you to take away is right now on the side of the sun that we are, Jupiter and Saturn are on the same side of the sun as us. And when the night sky faces out, we can see Jupiter and Saturn in June, July, and August all summer long. Great, great sights. Uh, to the naked eye or if you have binoculars or a telescope. So uh, real quick, I want to see if I can bring up the Sky and Telescope interactive sky map here. All right. So I went to the Sky and Telescope website and this is their interactive sky chart. Right now it's time for exactly the way we are. And there's Arcturus, the bright mag one star that we think River saw. Um, off to the north, you'll see Ursa Major and Polaris and all that. Uh, there's the ecliptic going through, uh, starting in the lower left, cutting through Scorpius and running across the sky through Virgo and Leo. And uh, what I want you to focus on is in the lower left-hand corner is 
Scorpius, currently right now, this very moment rising. So Antares should be visible to you tonight. Uh, Antares is the bright red star in the heart of Scorpio, right down here if my mouse is even visible. Yeah. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna advance the time by an hour. You ready? Here we go. Now it's darker. Scorpio has moved up and to the right. Another hour. Sagittarius in the center of the Milky Way is now visible, just rising to the left of Scorpius. The tail of Scorpius is now on the horizon. And if you look, Jupiter and Saturn have just risen on the ecliptic to the lower left. So one more hour. Here comes Jupiter and Saturn. And they march across the sky all night. I'm clicking an hour each time. So now it's dawn and Jupiter and Saturn and the moon are uh, off uh, to that part of the sky now. So I'm gonna back up. So what I like about this interactive sky chart, uh, your phone apps will do this too if you learn how to use it, is you can put in a time you know, for a month from now or an hour from now and you can click and you can watch the sky, night sky rotate around and see what's visible when. So that's a super cool tool and uh, I like it a lot. So back to our presentation to finish up. All right, this is 5B, what planets are visible for the next year. And you can fill that chart out based on what you've seen on the screen or using one of those apps or a website or something to, to finish it. But uh, the main thing I want you to get in there is that Jupiter and Saturn are rising all summer long and they get earlier uh, as time goes along. All right, so that's moving us past 5B. Uh, the moon, uh, good news is your uh, merit badge book has the phases of the moon. I really like this chart. It shows how the moon goes around the earth and the different phases. Um, so to the right of that diagram, is the sun. So if you look at the first one when it says new, the face of the sun that's lit up is facing away from the earth. So a new moon is nothing. It's just a, a, a grayish black disc. Nothing is lit up. As it proceeds around in its orbit, you'll see a crescent and then a quarter and a waxing gibbous. That's it getting bigger. And then when it's full, the moon is on the opposite side of the sun, so the side facing us is lit up. And then as it goes, continues its orbit around Earth, uh, you go back through waning gibbous, getting smaller. Then the third quarter, again, still waning or getting smaller. A uh, waning crescent means it shrunk down to just a thin crescent and back down to the new moon. That uh, entire rotation takes uh, 29 and some number of days. So that's why our months are about 30 days. The, the solar calendar and the lunar calendar aren't quite aligned anymore. They used to be, people used to go by the, the uh, orbit of the moon. But if you do that, your years start getting mixed up. So we switch to solar years. Uh, at any rate, it takes about 29 and something hours for the moon to go from new all the way through its waxing, waxing, full, waning, 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 and back to new. So that should be six A is sketched the face of the moon. I got a diagram for you there. You could use an online diagram. The moon is not rising until the middle of the night. So you're not gonna have a good chance to observe the moon uh, for about a week, uh, unless you wanna stay up really, really late. Um, so use a picture of the moon that you get online or in your merit badge book and uh, be sure and label five craters. Uh, craters are exactly what you think. It's when asteroids smack into the moon. The one thing I want to teach you about uh, all the asteroids on the surface of the moon, the craters on the surface of the moon is, the moon is absolutely covered in craters, and yet the Earth is not. And I think it should be really clear to you what the factors are in that, is the moon has no atmosphere to burn them up and it has no wind and waves to erase them. So every asteroid or micrometeorite to slam into the moon, the crater is still there. Whereas on earth, those things don't make it down to earth or if they are big enough, then we have erosion uh, and continental drift and all kinds of things to cover them up. So uh, there's some great big ones. 
you can see some of the craters in the picture on the screen and you look for the circular rim. Sometimes there's an impact peak in the center of the crater and then there are these lines that radiate out from debris that was cast out of the crater. Um, the seas are actually lava flows. They're made of basalt and they're a little bit darker. So you can see in the picture uh, that ancient astronomers thought that they were oceans of water. So they called them seas. Uh, uh, and that's why uh, the famous Sea of Tranquility, uh, which is in the right hand picture here, is to where the Apollo 11 landed. So uh, there's a famous phrase about the Sea of Tranquility. It's just a place on the moon. So use one of your maps to fill in your diagram for 6A and label them. 6B is sketching phases of the moon. If you wanna use an app for this so you can get the different phases, I'm fine with that. If you wanna substitute in the position of Jupiter and Saturn rising over the next uh, four nights, I'm fine with that. Just scratch it out and write in Jupiter and Saturn. Draw the horizon and show me four positions and four nights at the same time of night so that you can see the difference each night. That's the point of this. Uh, so do 6A, 6B, 6C is what factors keep the moon in orbit. This one should be pretty easy for you guys, but I will cover it. <clears throat> there are two factors that keep the moon in orbit. One of them keeps the moon attracted to the earth and the other one pushes it away from the earth. So it's a balance, right? So uh, uh, what force attracts the moon towards the Earth? Well, I think we all know Newton's law of gravity. Uh, if the moon were not moving, if it were just sitting still in space, the Earth and the moon, gravity would just attract them and they would just crash into each other. So what force is counteracting or balancing and pushing the moon away from the Earth? Well, the moon is going around the Earth at a really fast speed. So like anything in centrifugal force, as it spins around, it has motion away from the Earth. So if we were to cancel gravity, if we had an anti-gravity device to just make gravity go away, uh, instantly the moon would just fly off into space um, because gravity would no longer be holding it. So those two forces balance perfectly for the position that it's in. If it, were, if it were closer in, the force of its motion would drift it back out. If it were further away, the force of gravity would pull it back to where it is. So where it is, is the perfect balance between the attraction of gravity and the centrifugal force of its motion away from the Earth. Basically, you know, if you put a rubber ball on the end of a string and spin it around, you can feel the ball pulling on the string. That's the force that keeps it moving away from the Earth. Gravity is the uh, force that pulls it in. So uh, the answer to 6C is gravity and the force of motion. And I think you can see that in your mind, how that works. All orbits work the same way. The whole Milky Way is held together by those same forces. So in D, you're going to do the different phases of the moon. I showed you that diagram that's on the screen right now. So uh, when the moon in the first box, when the moon is between the earth and the sun, just draw an arrow from the sun to the moon and you'll see that the lit up side of the moon is facing away from the earth. The dark side of the moon is facing the earth. So the first box in the upper left is new moon, right? And that means nothing's visible. And then go through the rest of them. Uh, when you get to the box in the upper right where the moon is directly opposite the sun uh, and on the other side of the earth to the right of the earth that's full moon because the lit up side of the moon is facing the earth and the rest of those are crescent and quarter moons depending on the position and where the light is hitting it so you just label those and understand that this is a cycle that repeat repeats every 29 days all right we're almost done with the requirements. How are we doing on time, Carolyn? Okay, so I've got about five more minutes uh, to finish up seven. Eight and nine, you're just gonna keep notes on the rest of what we're doing tonight. Uh, and I'll cover those. So for seven, uh, 
you can get this from your merit badge book or you know online resources or just what you know. Uh, the sun is a big ball of molecular gas. What that means is it's made out of hydrogen. Um, you know, after the Big Bang, and uh, all the matter was formed. All the matter that was formed in the universe was hydrogen. And since that time, stars, big balls of hydrogen compressed by gravity, uh, when you compress hydrogen and you compress it and gravity squishes it and squishes it and squishes it, eventually it gets so hot and so compressed, it starts a reaction called fusion. And fusion is when atoms squish together and form another element. And the next element up the chart from hydrogen is helium. So when the sun fuses hydrogen into helium, it releases a lot of energy. You've probably heard of a fusion bomb. It works the same way, releasing energy. So a star is a balance between gravity squishing it into what eventually will be a black hole and the energy of the fusion reaction pushing out. Huge amounts of energy are released. But stars do come in various layers. Uh, you know, you can see on the chart, there's a radiation layer, there's convection between the layers, there are magnetic lanes and sunspots. There's a whole thing about solar astronomy and understanding flares and coronal mass ejections. So the composition is hydrogen fusing into helium. Uh, the relationship to other stars is it's a pretty ordinary star doing what other stars do and it's really far I think the very closest star is, you know, four or five light years away, but most of them are much further than that. Uh, the effect on Earth's weather, there wouldn't be any weather without the sun. Uh, our weather system is driven by the heat that hits the Earth and drives uh, the convection of air. And that whole system creates wind and clouds and rain and all that stuff. The effects on communications, when there's a solar storm, a flare or coronal mass ejection, a magnetic storm can be ejected by the sun and actually interrupt all of our communications. So there can be an interruption to communications caused by solar weather. Uh, B, sunspots. Uh, sunspots are the spots on the sun that they study up at Mount Wilson. It's been discovered that they are essentially magnetic storms. Uh, the center line or equator of the sun rotates faster than the poles because of uh, uh, various effects and uh, coronal effects. And what happens is all these magnetic lines get dragged around the sun with some of them moving f further ahead of others. And it's like a ball of yarn that gets all twisted up. And then when the ball short out and the magnetic lines form these big hoops and then they get cut, it releases these huge magnetic flares out into space. And uh, where those things form, where the center of those magnetic storms are on the surface of the sun, they actually form spots that you can see in a solar scope. Don't look at it with your eyes, you'll blind yourself. But if you have a filter and the right kind of telescope, you can look at it. Uh, and the effects of this stuff is it can interrupt communications. It actually has an effect here on Earth. Uh, so uh, I think that's it. 7C, uh, under red star, I want you to put Antares. Antares is a red giant, uh, late in its life, and it's big. Um, Vega is a blue star, so you can put a, a, a Vega there. Um, I think you pick one of the other yellow stars for your yellow star. And the meaning of these colors is uh, the spectrum, right? Is what the star is doing and what it's made out of. And I explained to you earlier about how color can tell you composition. It's called spectroscopy. And uh, the meaning of these colors is what the star is made out of. And that's how we learn about what stars are made out of. Okay. Uh, so with eight, we're counting our class and observing session that we're about to start uh, as B. And the time that you spent outside uh, earlier, even though much wasn't visible, or tonight as you make your uh, moon map or you were going to do Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, we're going to count that as an observing session and we're going to do some live demos for that. So you can check off B and then as I turn the screen over to the live telescopes, they're going to be telling you a little bit about their telescope, 
They're going to be telling you a little bit about what they're going to point at. You guys just fill in notes of what you're looking at and what you hear, and that'll cover 8B. At 9.30, we're going to do 9, and we're going to do a career panel. Um, so that covers the whole packet. Um, so before I start our live viewing session to cover uh, requirement eight, uh, does anyone have any questions about one through seven? Because I'm out of slides, I think. Let me see. Yeah. All right. So we're back. Um, do you guys have any questions about filling out your packet or any of the astronomical concepts that, that we've used to fill out the answers. Gideon, come off mute. I'm confused. No, I'm asking to the... Okay. I'm mostly confused about the... Um, mostly confused about the five and six. Number five and six. Five. Okay. So let's go back to five. Okay, so 5A are the five visible planets. You got that covered? Uh -huh. Are you okay with what planets are visible? Yep. Okay, so 5B are what planets are visible in those months. So on 5B, uh, start with June 2020. Uh-huh. And then in the columns, write Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, the five visible planets across the top. You follow uh -huh. me? Yep. And then for June of 2020, you're going to check Jupiter and Saturn. Those are the only two visible in our current month. Uh-huh. Okay. And then you got to do that for some more months. Like in July, Jupiter and Saturn are the only ones visible. So you check Jupiter and Saturn. So I'll go over it again. On 5B, across the top, you're going to put Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Uh-huh. And then you're going you're gonna to label what year, starting with June 2020, July 2020, August 2020. And then you're going to check which planets are visible in that month's night sky. You follow me, Gideon? Yeah. Okay, so I started you out. I showed you a chart I made, and I'm telling you verbally what the answer is for June. But you may have to look in your scout book or online to pull out some of the others. Yes. Uh, that makes sense? Uh -huh. Does that make sense? Truck. Let's get in. Uh-huh. Okay. Truck. So if you do end up getting confused, uh, Email me and I'll send you the chart I made and hopefully it'll help you make sense to fill yours out. Okay? Uh-huh. Can you right. can you send it to me? We're doing an astronomy class right now. You have to you have to email me. We're doing me. an astronomy class right now. Uh, okay. So just uh -huh. and, and maybe at the end I'll put my chart up if you wanna like see it again. But again, across five B across the top, put Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And for June 2020, the two visible planets are Jupiter and Saturn. That's also true in July. And then from there, you got to do the rest of the months. Uh, okay? Thanks. All right. All right. Go on mute. All right. So uh, I'll try to have a little more time for Q&A towards the end. Uh, I want to uh, check in uh, with... Uh, Spencer, are you ready, or you want me to? Yeah, I'm. I'm okay. Uh, actually, I have. Uh, I'm also trying to get into the meeting with my cell phone, so I can just show people what the uh, setup looks like. So, if you can just let me into the room, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Carolyn's going to let you in right now. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to uh, for the scouts uh, and the other folks online. Uh, Sue. Who Spencer is a club member who has a really nice astronomy setup in his backyard. Okay. And he's taken the time to join us tonight with a, a live viewing of his telescope and I think some views through the telescope. Uh, there is, a, there is a Spencer uh, connecting on his iPhone. That's great. So uh, at this okay. point, uh, Spencer, uh, once your audio is up, 
I'm going to let you tell the scouts a little bit about what they're seeing and what kind of setup you have, and we'll see if it works. Okay, so you should be hearing me now, right? Yeah, I can hear you just fine, so I think okay, everyone fine. can. Okay, fine. So yeah. uh, here, this is uh, I'm trying to show what my telescope looks like. Let's see, let's see if this is going to work. <laughs> Hang on, let me get a larger flashlight, just one second. So what Spencer is doing is before he shows you the view through the telescope, he wants to show you a view of the telescope to tell you what kind of telescope you're going to be looking through. <coughs> and that's one of the things for your notes on, uh, what is it, was it eight? Um, he said looking right. at the packet. Okay, can you guys see my eight telescope me. now? Uh, we can. Okay, so this is a Schmidt Cassegrain. So this is similar to the um, to the one that uh, Greg showed a picture of, uh, sort of like the one at Mount Wilson, except that having instead of the light coming out through the side, it actually the light goes in through the front, hits the primary mirror in the back here, bounces up to a secondary mirror in the front, and then comes out to a hole in the back. And so on the back, I have a camera hooked up to it. I don't know if you can see it. It's that red camera. And then there's a uh, eyepiece. So I've got a mirror here that flips. So I can either flip the mirror out of the way and the light goes straight to the camera or, or I can put it in and it's a 45 degree angle and then the light comes up and through the eyepiece. So uh, other things I've hooked on the scope, this is a guide scope. So basically I do a lot of astrophotography. So uh, as Greg pointed out, the earth rotates and uh, stars will move out of the field of view really quickly. So there are two things you can do. One is you can make sure the telescope is lined up very perfectly or close as you can to the parallel of the Earth's axis. And so that way minimize the rotation, but there's still a little bit of rotation. And so what the guide scope does is that actually it's a scope with a camera here, this silver thing at the back. And then that is actually plugged into my computer. And um, what I do is I find a star with that guide scope and tell the computer to lock onto it. And so it moves my mount just by very small amounts to keep that star centered and that gets rid of the rotation. Um, on the other side here, I've got uh, a finder scope. And so this is a, uh, has a much smaller field of view, so it lets me find things. This is similar to what Greg was showing you, a Telrad. So it's just a piece of glass mount at a 45 degree angle. It projects a bullseye on there and you look through it and you can line up the telescope. So normally I'll use this to get close to a star, then I'll fine tune it with this. And then by the time I fine tune it with this, it's in my eyepiece. So that's a, that's a process for doing it. Any questions on this? Okay, so I have this uh, telescope pointed at Vega right now. And so, let me see, let me just share the screen. Hang on one second, okay. Uh, so what, what Spencer is doing is the digital image that comes through his telescope and into his camera feeds into his laptop. He's gonna share that with us. So we're gonna see the live view of the star through his telescope. Um, and we, we tested it on Saturday, so this is, uh, here we go. All right. Are you seeing it? 